everyone, welcome to IPBM's one hour live stream of our 101 course, the camera section. So today we're going to take an hour look at cameras at a, a really high level overview, you know, like a 10,000 foot overview. We're not going to get really nitty gritty down in the weeds with uh, fine technical details. We do have another uh, 11 hours of training in the 101 course. And beyond the 101, we have another, uh, you know, six weeks, 12 sessions for the camera course. So if you are interested in finding out more about technical details and concepts and um, scenario-based testing, uh, let me know. We can talk about those, those courses. Uh, but today should be a good uh, foundation with some fundamental information about cameras. Uh, like I mentioned before we started the uh, proper presentation, if you do have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Uh, you know, definitely make it more engaging and exciting if uh, I'm answering your specific questions about cameras. All right, so some of the basic components, some of the basic hardware that makes up a camera. Uh, there are uh, many different components, and we'll talk about some of the core features of a camera. Uh, one, obviously the lens, right? That's what the, the camera is going to be uh, providing the field of view through. We have uh, different focal lengths. Uh, focal length is re represented by a lowercase italic F. So if you ever um, see that on a specification sheet or a spec sheet from a manufacturer, you know that they're talking about focal length, which is a distance between uh, basically the back of the lens and the image sensor. <clears throat> there are different types of lenses. We have a uh, uh, fixed focal length, which is uh, many of you might be familiar with specifying a camera that has 2.8 millimeter focal length. Uh, that's the, the, the lens of the length. So it's going to be pretty short focal length. Uh, typically, one of the, the shortest that's offered by manufacturers off the shelf, uh, aside from fish eyes, right? Those are going to be sub two millimeter focal length. And we also have varifocal, where you can zoom in and out. So as the light goes through the lens, it hits the CMOS sensor or the imager. Uh, these terms can be used interchangeably when we're talking about IP cameras. Uh, imager, sensor, CMOS sensor, um, or you know, if you're at a party and you, you want to throw out complementary metal oxide semiconductor, um, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to have a lot of conversations start up about that, uh, but any of those can be used interchangeably or synonymously to describe the image sensor of a video surveillance camera. And basically, uh, the job of that is to receive uh, light signals, right? So we want to uh, we want to convert photons to electrons, right? That's the job of the video surveillance camera. So the light is going to hit that image sensor and then uh, send that information to the SOC for processing. Uh, maybe some uh, other steps in between, uh, but simplifying that, we have light that's going to go through the lens, hit the imager, uh, this imager here, right in the center of the camera, the CMOS sensor. And convert those photons to electrons that creates an electrical signal, which is our uh, video or our image. So a couple different types of lenses that we have. We have, um, uh, like I said, we have uh, fixed focal length. So you can order, you know, maybe if you're uh, working with Hanwha or VivoTech or, or Hike Vision or Axis, whoever it is. Um, you're ordering a 2.8 millimeter lens and that, that field of view is very wide. Uh, so maybe you want, you want a more narrow field of view. Maybe instead of getting all of reception and the uh, front door of the facility that you're surveilling, maybe the customer says, hey, you know what? I just want higher pixel density uh, on the entryway and I don't care about reception over here. We don't, we don't need to do that. We can narrow it down. So you could get a four millimeter length or a longer length, uh, or if you want an even more narrow uh, field of view, you could go up to 12 millimeter. Many manufacturers offer fixed focal length cameras in different iterations of focal length so that you can get different field of view widths or angles of view from the same, basically the same camera. Uh, they just have maybe a few different skews for that. And then when we look at uh, manual uh, varifocal, you can see, I don't know if anybody's touched one of these in a few years, but um, Axis a couple of years ago came out with a um, uh, uh, manual varifocal multi-imager. Uh, they quickly deprecated that in favor of uh, electronic controls. But these uh, control knobs here are basically thumb screws that you, you, know, you just loosen up, move around for um, the course control would be zoom, and then you tighten it up. And then the, the fine control 
would be uh, focus, the other control knob here. If you see a third control knob, uh, probably iris control. You might see these on uh, maybe a box camera or something similar to. And then most common, uh, motorized varifocal. Now, many integrators, we, we've, uh, Jermaine, if you could throw this into the Zoom chat, we, we've surveyed um, many integrators to find out, hey, what, what are you using? Are you using, you know, we have over 16,000 members that we can leverage their insights from, subject matter experts working out in the field. And one of the things that we'll do is we'll pay them to complete a survey. So they'll tell us, hey, we're using uh, varifocal and this is why, or we're using uh, motorized varifocal, this is why we're using fixed focal, uh, and this is why. So one of the things that we have <clears throat> is a survey post like this, where we can see that uh, a few years ago, varifocal versus fixed focal, 68% of respondents are using varifocal for many of the reasons that I stated. You know, If we need to widen out that field of view or tighten it up, uh, we can. We don't have to replace the camera. We can zoom in, we can zoom out, and we can widen or narrow that field of view. So it makes it more flexible. Uh, then we have uh, flexibility of adjustment. And then we have quotes from the um, integrators. Uh, specifying why exactly they're using varifocal versus fixed focal. Because one of the things that you'll, you'll see when you look at products in the marketplace is that when we look at uh, fixed focal length cameras, they're going to be a lower end product with less features. Maybe they don't have IO ports. Maybe they don't have um, uh, SD card slots or audio or uh, other features. Uh, maybe they don't have true WDR. Uh, maybe they're not as good in low light, but uh, absolutely varifocal cameras typically are more feature rich than uh, fixed focal length. Not always true, but uh, pretty common to see more features on varifocal cameras, absolutely. And for transmission, uh, you know, we have to basically, you know, we just talked about the, the light particles, right? That, uh, you know, uh, quantum, the uh, photons going into the uh, lens and hitting the image sensor and then converting that to electrons that we're going to send for processing and create our video surveillance with. Now, after the camera's done its job, we need to send that somewhere. We either need to send it to a, uh, a server or a VMS or an NVR or viewing station or my phone or my laptop, whatever it is, uh, we're sending that data somewhere. And the way that we do that with IP equipment is through a NIC or a network interface card. Uh, and this is commonly uh, labeled LAN, uh, maybe PoE, uh, which stands for power over ethernet. You know, the days of using uh, separate power and data are, I don't want to say completely gone, but uh, in many cases, uh, it's just gone. You know, PoE is ubiquitous nowadays. Uh, it's uh, very readily um, found and available. Uh, Miklos, great point. So he's saying fixed focal is great when you don't want moving parts, e.g., you know, you install a, a um, camera on a vehicle, also, you know, any kind of mass transport, like, uh, you know, uh, buses or, or trucks or something like that. Uh, trains, uh, another one. And then for analog, so the, the one that uh, I just showed was for IP-based cameras. Now, when we, when we talk about IP cameras, we're going to be using Ethernet cabling, power over Ethernet, and network cards. When we talk about analog cameras, they're going to use analog connections, which are uh, kind of like you see here, this BNC connector, which is a, a coaxial connection. And, uh, this one happens to be a uh, twist lock. And I'll bring up real quick, I'll bring up my um, uh, exact vision. Oh, there we go. Uh, in one moment, I'll bring up exact vision of VMS that we have uh, with a couple cameras set up in it so that we can uh, take a live look at some of these cameras. So after, after the light goes through the lens and it hits the image sensor, it's going to go to the sock. So a sock, if, if you're not familiar with IP cameras, a sock is a system on a chip. Uh, and this is a big deal in our industry right now. Because when we look at socks, uh, there are many different uh, systems on a chip that are um, uh, you know, uh, critical right now because many of them have been banned. Uh, this branding right here is high silicon. So when I look at that, that uh, word mark, high silicon, I know that 
Um, we can no longer use that for uh, government applications or any government funded projects. So knowing what socks are in a camera is important. And many manufacturers now are listing NDAA compliant equipment because of the uh, uh, John McCain Act or the NDAA uh, that's been passed. So the, the purpose of a, a SOC is to process uh, the video from the camera. So there's many things that the SOC is going to do. Uh, at a 10,000 foot overview, it's basically going to take the images from the image sensor, uh, provide processing to them. This is kind of, uh, if you equate it to a, to a computer, it kind of be the, um, you know, the CPU of the computer and the memory and uh, maybe even the uh, uh, GPU in a computer, but uh, obviously much less uh, processing power here since these are very small components. One of the limitations of you know computing camera side is the amount of uh, you know power that we can get out of a sock. So some of the other components that we see on a camera, IR. So when we don't have enough of those photons, right? When there's not enough light coming from either, you know, the, the facility lighting that we have, the house lighting that we have, or from the sun uh, outside, uh, we can shore that up with infrared light. So we have a uh, light that's visible, white light visible to the human eye uh, that the camera can see as well and uh, can provide enough signal through the uh, image sensor to provide a usable image, right? Then when it gets dark, we don't have enough uh, light hitting the image sensor to provide a usable image. So what we do in most cases, we use infrared. Uh, not always. There are some super low light cameras. Uh, uh, several of them, you know, from most manufacturers have some version of super low light camera that might not use IR. Um, and then there are some cameras that don't have IR, but uh, uh, IR is another technology that's pretty ubiquitous in 2022. So there's a few different ways that this, this may appear. Um, you may have many IR LEDs surrounding the lens. Um, you may have a single large LED, uh, a few large LEDs. Uh, and PTZs, it can look even more different because you have, you know, as you zoom in 500 feet, you have different beam width of IR. You know, some's going to be wide um, and a little bit dimmer at near range. And then when you zoom in far, it's going to be a much more narrow beam width, kind of matching the field of view of the camera as best they can. And IR infrared light is not visible to the human eye. However, the IR LED um, is visible to the um, human eye. Probably one of the most common features it found on a camera that's not used. Uh, the, the greatest combination of here's a feature on a video surveillance camera uh, with a feature that is not used is absolutely audio. Um, there are many states where, you know, two-party consent, where audio might not even be an option or whatever part of the world you're in might not be an option. But many, many cameras do have built-in microphones or input-output jacks or input-output terminals where you can wire in external devices to the camera. Um, this is typically not going to be found on a fixed focal camera. Again, you know, if, if we have fixed focal cameras, they're probably going to be a lot more uh, featureless than feature rich. And then some other uh, options that we have for uh, camera features are on onboard storage. So there's a few different reasons that people want to use SD cards. Uh, maybe we have a um, an outpost where uh, you know we're sending sending uh, data back to the um, the HQ with a cradle point or some other cellular router, right? So we have a, a NEMA box on a pole camera and we're just sending, we're not recording there, we're sending it back to uh, an NVR somewhere else. So maybe what we wanna do is uh, also have an SD card in this. So if that link goes down, maybe we can trickle that uh, missing information back. The other thing is some people might elect not to have an NVR or VMS and just record on SD cards on all of their cameras. Uh, that could be a management nightmare <laughs> if you're, um, you know, managing the cameras independently, uh, rather typically for a small environment, you might get away with that. Um, but uh, for backup, for primary recording, uh, absolutely SD cards are a, uh, a commonly used way to record, whether it's backup or primary. And then some common form factors. When we look at the, the size and shape of cameras, 
there's a bunch of different uh, form factors that we can look at. So there are, uh, we have uh, domes, which come in different sizes. We have uh, micro domes, mini domes, full-size domes, uh, turrets, which uh, many people uh, have kind of transitioned to preferring sometimes, uh, especially I think outdoors when you look at the uh, potential for, um, you know, if this is facing outward rather than downward, you have the uh, potential for inclement weather to affect it, whether it's snow, rain, or sun. And then uh, with this one, with the turret, the flat face dome over on the right, top right, there's a, a big difference here. The, the IR LED is under a separate piece of glass. So if there's any problem with seals or anything else, you're not going to get IR bounce back or IR bleeding. So uh, turrets have been favored for, for that reason. Um, although all manufacturers, pretty sure every manufacturer makes a dome. Not every manufacturer makes a turret. Uh, they, the, the turret started as a um, uh, Eastern um, kind of form factor and more Western companies are beginning to manufacture them over the years. And then below that, we have bullets, which, um, you know, if, if you don't want a uh, um, um, less, a, less uh, in your face camera, uh, if you want something that's more overt than covert. Uh, bullet might be a good choice for, for form factor. And again, those come in uh, small form factor uh, or larger too. They come in multiple different sizes and vary pretty greatly. And some manufacturers will have all of those cameras with basically the same exact specifications, just in different, feet, different uh, form factors for you. Some of the others that are uh, much less commonly used our uh, box camera, cube camera, probably the least used form factor camera, uh, typically integrated uh, PIR, which is a uh, passive infrared, so you can detect motion, uh, two-way audio, which is a, a feature some might want in their office. And then um, the bottom left is a, a covert camera, uh, pretty common in, in Mac machines and other applications where you might need uh, either small spaces or covert use. And then on the right, um, growing in popularity from uh, consumer cameras uh, years and years ago to uh, changing the way that intercoms work to becoming, you know, more uh, full blown video intercoms, door stations and access controllers uh, is on the right there. Just going to check chat real quick. Looks like we're doing all right in chat. All right, so resolution, uh, looking at uh, pixels, right? When we talk about pixels and pixel density and pixels per foot or pixels per meter, uh, depending upon where in the world you are, uh, we're talking about resolution and we're talking about how many, uh, at times, how many pixels are within a certain amount of space uh, across a, a scene here. So across this little window up here, I have about a thousand pixels uh, running across and the total field of view, there's about 2 million pixels because I'm using a, a 1080p camera on my webcam or uh, about 2 million, 2 megapixels, which is 2 million pixels. So in this little window, there's uh, you know potential for 2 million pixels um, when I have uh, that webcam on. So when we look at the resolution of a camera or the pixel count, it, it doesn't necessarily indicate that we're gonna have a greater image. So if I have a four megapixel camera and a 4K camera, it would make logical sense that the 4K camera has twice the amount of pixels, right? Four megapixels, four million pixels. Uh, 4K camera is actually eight megapixel, which is eight million pixels. So we have twice the amount of pixels. I should be able to get a better image. That's not necessarily true. If I'm using a really cheap 4K camera and a really high-end four megapixel camera that has super low light, strong WDR, there may be 12 hours a day where I'm getting, or more, or 24 hours a day, where I'm getting better video than I am from the 4K camera. So it really depends on uh, the features of the camera and the performance of the camera, but uh, absolutely uh, pixels uh, do determine uh, potential. They do not determine performance. There's so many different scenarios that come into determining performance. And we'll, we'll take a look at um, some of those coming up.
So some of the uh, um, things that we see is resolution changing over time. And Jermaine, can you throw in a report? We have a, a statistics report on um, the most common resolutions used, which is uh, where I nabbed this uh, slide from, this uh, graph from. So you can see in 2020, um, we did a survey. Again, we, we uh, asked our integrators, members, hey, what are you using? What are you deploying? And you can see that 1080p is 44% uh, lion's share. But if you add up higher than 1080p, uh, that's where most people are using. You know, 37% plus 18%, uh, 5 megapixel plus 18%. So if we add that up, that's absolutely more than the, the 1080p share. So, uh, and that wasn't always the case. When we look at uh, historically, um, you know, the, the resolution shift is going up and there's many reasons for that. Um, you know, storage has dropped, compression has increased, uh, codecs are getting better, you know, the advent going from MJPEG to H.264 to H.265 and adding smart codecs, which have matured over the years on both of those uh, codecs. So if anyone's interested, Jermaine just dropped that into chat. Uh, it is the uh, camera resolution usage statistics where we take a look at who's what resolutions are most popular and why are people using them you know the the real meaningful of uh why are people moving up um and it's you know due to uh, uh several different factors like um the cost of storage and compression and uh other factors that have changed that shift So some of the video quality concerns that we have are caused by light levels. Um, light is the biggest adversary for video surveillance quality. When we look at these quality issues, here you can see a, um, a real noisy scene uh, with uh, the subject blown out. You know, it's uh, overexposed. And then in this scene on the right, we have... Um, uh, Rob standing in a, uh, you won't even know it's Rob, but he's standing in a threshold uh, near me in the studio where he's holding up a, a eye chart and the door is open to the exterior space. So we see the threshold of the exterior door and open it up and it looks like, uh, you know, kind of like the pearly gates to heaven. You just see this blast of light and it's so overexposed. You can't even see any of the scene behind him. And I actually have a, a great demo to, to kind of showcase what we're talking about when we uh, talk about WDR. So some of some of the issues when we get to uh, low light are getting good details, you know, making sure that the subject isn't uh, artifacting or there's not motion blur or that it's not so noisy that we can't even see what's going on with the subject. So here is noise. Uh, we talked about light, right? We talked about turning photons into electrons using the image sensor. So when, when we don't have enough light hitting that image sensor, we artificially inflate that digital signal, right? And the way that we do that is through a technology called gain. So gain enhances the image sensor sensitivity, but the byproduct of that is that we get this digital noise, this unwanted side effect of uh, kind of static. And that also has another side effect that that uh, let me just go back a slide real quick. So the, the other unwanted side effect of this is, you know, cameras are little computers. And when the camera sees movement, that's data that it needs to transmit over our network, which is uh, bandwidth or bitrate utilization. And then we need to store it. Right. So if we need to store all of the movement, all of this little wiggling static and noise that uh, uh, kind of uh, dancing uh, rice or uh, whatever you want to call it, it is going to uh, be registered as movement and it's going to transmit that movement. So typically you see a huge jump in low light scenes for bandwidth because of that, because of the uh, uh, side effect, you know, you turn up gain and, or automatic gain is uh, enabled and turned up. And then the side effect is digital noise. 
And then uh, obviously a, a major problem in low light scenes is going to be darkness, right? Maybe you just can't get, uh, uh, if you don't have a low light camera, if you don't have IR enabled, uh, if you, so what we do is we enable integrated IR, uh, infrared light, which are those little red LEDs that we see that the light from them is not visible to the human eye. However, it is visible to the camera. You know, we'll move the cut filter out of the way, kind of take the sunglasses off of the camera so that it can see that IR light and use it, uh, capture that light on the uh, image sensor and pass that to the SOC for processing. One of the problems that we can have is that we can see uh, IR overexposure, which isn't uncommon. You know, it's, it's uh, 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 definitely a problem. Some manufacturers have come up with solutions where they have uh, smart IR or adaptive IR, where they're um, trying to compensate for this problem and correct it. Uh, there's also a problem with hot spots. Um, you can see how bright the floor is on the bottom right hand side of the screen and how dark the floor is in the back. Um, that's a, a IR hot spot. And even if you do use IR, there's still no guarantee that you might not have uh, motion blur in that scene. All right, so here's that picture of Rob, the, the one that I showed you before when he was on the right. This is the same doorway he was standing in. Now, the difference, the camera that was used in that example that's in the slide deck previously, um, that camera, uh, here he is on the right, that camera does not have true WDR. So uh, what some manufacturers might do is deploy digital WDR or no WDR. So this is wide dynamic range. And when we talk about wide dynamic range, we're talking about uh, huge differences in light levels, right? We have really bright light. Uh, like if you're deploying video surveillance for a, uh, a, a store with a glass storefront or a uh, business center with a, a huge glass wall lobby, um, and then maybe you have an, another area of that that's uh, you know drywalled or uh, finished without windows. So there's going to be a big light level difference between those areas. Or maybe you work in an industrial environment where you have an overhead door that opens up and there's you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 lux outside. Uh, lux is a measurement of light. And then you only have 200 lux inside. So it's a you know, regular office work environment or a little bit dimmer. So when we look at the scene, we can tell that Rob isn't really exposed that well. So even if there's a, you know, going back to the resolution or, or pixels provide potential, but not guarantee performance, here's a great example. I don't care what the resolution of this camera is on the right. It doesn't provide good forensic evidence that we need to figure out what happened, um, whether it's a, you know, a crime or insurance claim or whatever the evidence is needed for. We're not going to be able to figure it out using that image. And that's why um, strong WDR is a key feature in uh, cameras today, being able to get good usable evidence. Um, so even if, if that last camera was a 4K camera and this one was a 1080p, Obviously, the 1080p camera with strong WDR or true WDR is the much better solution. And the way that manufacturers achieve this is by instead of taking one picture, right, uh, with exposure for the whole scene evenly um, and trying the best and you saw what happens, it just fails, maybe applying some processing to it and then presenting it, it's going to look like uh, uh, it's going to look pretty horrible. So one of the, um, the things that manufacturers do is they'll take not one image, but maybe two or three or six. Uh, they'll take multiple images and they'll expose them differently. So one, they may have a long exposure inside where they're letting light hit the image sensor for a longer period of time so that it can get the details in these dark areas. And then it'll have a short exposure where it's going to get the bright light exposed properly. So that's two different exposures. We can put those together and use the best parts from each image uh, and create a usable image. Now in this scene, they're probably using multiple images. And then after that, after the, the multiple uh, basically pictures are taken, they're gonna also apply some processing to get rid of any um, movement that changed. So if there's any blurring around the edges, uh, manufacturers have uh, technology, you know, post, uh, processing that will clean that up. And this is happening in like, you know, a 15th of a second or a 20th of a second. This is happening very, very quickly. 
uh, quick enough so that we can get multiple exposures maybe 15 times in one second for 15 frames a second, right? So this is happening very, very quickly. Uh, this is not a long process. Quick enough that we're seeing fluid live video. So what I'll do is I'll show you, we have um, a couple of cameras set up in our warehouse, right? So they're, they're very similar fields of view. The one on the right's a little bit wider. Um, so it's taking in uh, more uh, a more challenging uh, field of view, the one on the left, right? A little bit larger. So the um, scene that we have here is uh, the warehouse where we do our testing. If anyone here is familiar with IPBM testing, this is looking the other way at the business end of where we're mounting cameras and setting up for testing. So there's a few things going on in the field of view on the left, right? We have a, a measuring wheel on the left here. We have a network rack, a little gator cart with uh, some switches and equipment. We have a couple different um, tiers of uh, DJ light tripods with all different video surveillance cameras and uh, uh, backboard mounted on them. And then an eye chart with a color palette for color fidelity and resolving power. So if we look at both fields of view, I think we're getting very similar information from both of them. We're getting very similar, um, very similar evidence from both. Now, when uh, the scene becomes more challenging, so there's about 300 lux right here. Uh, pretty pretty uh, nicely lit environment. Um, now, uh, this may become more challenging if we open that um, overhead bay door because outside is about 15,000 lux. So the camera on the left is using true WDR where it is going to take multiple exposures, right? It's going to expose long and short so we get details inside and out. The one on the right is not using true WDR, it's using digital WDR. And the big difference that you're seeing here is that it's just trying to expose once evenly for the entire scene and get the best details it can. The, the problem that we have here is that the details on the left, you notice how much darker they got. And the details outside, while we can see there's a van here, um, I can't see any of the, the, the other details. In this field of view, I see that um, uh, Penske, yellow Penske moving truck from the bakery next door, and uh, a lot more details on the left than the right. Now, that may even become uh, more exaggerated if the scene is even more challenging than it already is, which uh, it can be. You know, if maybe we have the, um, if the lights are turned off. So now we just have the ambient light coming in from outside. I just uh, turn the lights off in the, um, uh, warehouse. And I'll just close so you can see when I when I open up this door, when we go from only, uh, you know, with this door shut, it's probably only a Lux or two, uh, one or two Lux. So you'll see the uh, difference in, in when this opens up, what you're able to see immediately. So now opening this up, you'll see, if you look at the bottom of the door, you can see immediately that this is exposing properly on the outside loading dock area. We can see those uh, cans, the van, and all the other details. Even the lines painted on the parking lot are easily discerned on the image on the left using true WDR, where we have all these multiple exposures and probably some processing applied to it as well. And on the right, again, with the, the lights turned off, I turn the lights off in this bay, uh, it, it's just too dark over here to get any good usable evidence um, or anything meaningful. Maybe we know that somebody's in the field of view, but uh, we won't be able to uh, get any um, details from them. And same thing outside. The, the difference in details is uh, uh, a lot. So that's why WDR is very important. And it's just one of the many reasons why we say uh, pixels determine potential, but do not guarantee performance. Because if you're deploying a um, if you're deploying a, a camera in a W in a, a strong WDR scene or wide dynamic range scene where those light levels are going to be huge differences, and there's many different applications. Um, you know, anything with a window in the field of view, anything in an external door, anything in a, a low lit environment that opens into a bright lit, or vice versa. Uh, those are all going to be calls for uh, true WDR cameras. Um, so you can see the, the difference in why it, why it matters.
All right. So the, the big detail is, uh, you know, seeing the subject in the background. And the reason that, you know, another reason that this is important is being able to see, is there, is there one actor or are there five other um, uh, people with this person? You know, how many, how many uh, bad actors or how many criminals or how many suspects or, you know, who was in the field of view? Was there a car behind him? You know, if he backed his truck up to the door, I'd probably be able to see uh, a lot of details, like make model color, maybe part of the plate or at least a state. Um, so it's, that's all meaning, meaningful, usable evidence. And we're not going to get that with uh, uh, non-WDR or digital WDR when the light levels have that kind of delta between them. All right, so another thing to take away is that all video and video surveillance is compressed. Any of the um, uh, video that we watch has been compressed. Even if we have compression all the way down, quality all the way up, there's still compression happening. Uh, and that's a good thing. If we, if we didn't have that, uh, you know, video surveillance data would easily overrun our network uh, and it would make it unusable. So there are, um, uh, there is compression happening from the uh, camera and uh, before transmission. And then we can control beyond the uh, compression that happens. We can uh, con control compression after that. So we can, uh, we can turn up, you know, it's uh, at odds, right? So you can either turn up quality, which is gonna lower compression, or we can turn up uh, compression and that's gonna lower quality. Uh, there, uh, the inverse of controls, some manufacturers in their web interface may have something that says quality, others may have compression. Um, it depends on what manufacturer you're working with, but just understand that those two things are at odds. You're trading off um, you know, either uh, more information and more data remaining or details being removed from the video surveillance. Uh, and you know, compression used wisely is a great thing. You know, we can easily remove a lot of data from video and not have it um, look degraded to the human eye in any means. You know, it's when you crank compression all the way up or even to a certain point where you start noticing blocking or um, other issues with compression that you're gonna see a difference in the, um, in the quality. And the reason that we want compression is because, again, we talked about transmission. Um, one example was we have a far flung camera at an outpost and it's on a pole using a cradle point. Uh, that, that's a great place that we might want to use um, uh, compression over possibly a metered connection um, or in a, uh, a location that has constraints on bandwidth. And then the, the other reason we may want to use this, um, a, a huge trend, uh, you know, big three biggest trends in our industry right now are uh, cloud or VSAS, uh, AI or uh, you know analytics and artificial intelligence, and then U.S.-China relations. Those are uh, absolutely the biggest three trends that we have right now. So it, with one of them being cloud, obviously a bottleneck is going to be our um, ISP, getting our data from our systems on-prem, you know, our cameras and maybe our bridge or our, our um, uh, you know, whatever kind of relay agent we're using you know, that's going to act as a, um, a cloud VMS or a bridge to the cloud services. That's uh, a place where we're probably going to want to employ some uh, compression so that we're not uh, bottlenecking there. Also, we might want to have different compression for uh, remote viewing or uh, things like that. So the uh, compressions that we use today, uh, if you're using MJPEG, please go ahead and see if you can change that to H.264. You're going to realize, I don't know, five to ten times the amount of savings and uh, bandwidth and in storage costs. Uh, so that's the other thing. You know, when we compress this, we're able to store more. So if we're using H.264 or H.265, it's going to be uh, night and day compared to MJPEG. And H.264 is H.265 uh, is... I would say that an incremental increase over H.264, there are some advantages there. Um, but the, the big one over H.264, H.265 might be the smart codecs where um, there's uh, 
you know, different things like dynamic iframe and uh, dynamic compression and uh, these different technologies that manufacturers each have their, their own iteration of it. But the, the big change in H.264 and H.265 was the fact that we can do inter-frame compression. So before this with MJPEG, we were just doing intra-frame, which means that we compress, you know, we basically take a picture, this little picture of me in the corner, and then you apply compression with it. So maybe this area in the background where it's all gray, where there's no movement, we can compress that very highly. We don't, we don't care about it, right? Um, and maybe we don't care that much about this. Or if uh, I'm not in the image, we can compress it even more so. Um, but this is not a very challenging scene, so we can deploy compression. Now, a big deal would be, hey, what if we could, what if we could compress only that gray area and not compress the subject or the area of interest that we care about? And that, that was a big change um, between, uh, you know, um, dynamic compression with the smart codex, but with the interframe compression, now we can change compression between frames, right? We're only going to signal the movement. So now when we have me sitting here, you know, the only thing that we're going to send from the next frame is my hand moving or my mouth because I'm uh, nonstop talking here. So we don't have to send stuff that doesn't change, like the, the microphone, maybe uh, part of my body and all of the gray area around me. We don't need to send that because there's no new information. There's no movement, there's no change. So there's no data to be transmitted. And that's a big difference between interframe and uh, intraframe. So here with interframe, we're only sending the changes from frame one to frame two. And what has changed? So in this case, uh, this blue guy is waving and that's all he's doing. He's not walking, not running, not jumping, not spinning, uh, just moving his arm, waving. So the only data that we have to send are the parts that change. Basically his arm in the background that changed that was blocked or is now blocked by his arm. So you can imagine, um, you know, I said a 1080p camera is um, two megapixel, right? And it looks like 44% of integrators are using that. So it's a, a pretty popular thing. So if this frame is 2 million pixels, think about sending 2 million pixels worth of data to your recorder and then storing 2 million pixels worth of data. Now compare that to, you know, sending that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we send that 10 times, nine times, right? 2 million pixels um, that many times. Now we don't have to do that. Now we can send a, an iframe, which is going to be the, um, the first frame, the full frame, all 2 million pixels, we send it. Now the next frame, we're going to send a P frame, a predictive frame, or a uh, partial frame. We're gonna, only going to send a piece of that information, the part that moves, the part that's interesting, that we care about. And when we send that, that P frame, it's going to be a very small amount of data. And if you ever watch the bit rate on a camera, you can see that it might go from like, you know, let's say um, uh, four megabits a second, and then it drops down to just kilobits. Uh, and when that's happening, that, that full four megabits might be that full frame, that uh, iframe that's being sent. And then when the bandwidth drops down, you might be looking at uh, P frames being sent. But it's a tremendous amount less of data. Maybe instead of 2 million pixels, maybe that arm is only you know 20,000 or 100,000 pixels. Uh, whatever it is, it's certainly less than the entire frame of 2 million pixels being not only transmitted, but also uh, stored. So you can see that that one uh, P frame compared to the other, or the one I frame compared to the other P frames, a huge difference in the amount that we're going to be um, transmitting. And then when we, uh, I started to talk about this in the last slide, but then when we started talking about smart codecs, so when we talk about, um, you know, uh, Zipstream or H.264 Plus or, you know, whatever the manufacturers are calling their own uh, smart codec, there is uh, dynamic compression. So now instead of just compressing, um, like I said before, uh, and compressing the whole scene, now we can say, hey, you know what? None of this is moving back here. So we can really compress that gray wall. Um, so maybe instead of a million shades of gray, we only need 100, right? Or tan, whatever the color of the wall is, light blue. So, and then where the subject is, we want low compression because we're interested in, in whatever this, uh, this guy is doing here. Um, so we want to have low compression on movement 
because that's what we're interested in, uh, the changes in the scene. And then we can, uh, uh, not we, the manufacturer will, or the camera will use dynamic compression to compress the dormant or unmoving areas or unchanged areas and uh, apply lower compression. So that's dynamic compression, which is a feature of uh, smart codecs. Along with some other things that we can do, you know, we, we've looked at in the last one, uh, iframes. So we have a, an iframe here, and then we have nine P frames, right? So one of the other things that um, uh, smart codecs can do is they can say, hey, you know what? Instead of sending um, nine P frames, uh, there's no movement in the scene. Let's send like 10 or 20 or 30 P frames because there's no real movement in the scene. So we can do that and probably get away with it. Now, if the scene becomes really busy and there's a lot of motion in it, a lot of moving, uh, maybe we shorten that iframe interval. And instead of nine P frames, now we see a full frame on the second or third or fourth. So we're cutting down that iframe interval to get better usable evidence, or we're elongating that iframe interval to bring down our bandwidth and bitrate utilization and ultimately, you know, the storage, wherever we're storing that, whether it's on an NVR on site or a VMS or in the cloud. Um, so one, one of the other things that I want to do, we, we talked about um, form factors and I'll, I'll come back to this and jump around a little. So we talked about different form factor cameras. A couple of the cameras that we don't have on here uh, that we didn't list are um, PTZs, uh, a fisheye camera and multi-imager. So I'll bring up, um, I'll bring up a couple of cameras that we can look at to uh, give another um, demonstration here. I'll just load those in my other window here. Because one of the things that I, I, I think is important is to show different use case applications of cameras and, and why you may or may not want that. Um, and I think it's a, a meaningful example to show the uh, use and co compare and contrast the PTZ versus the fisheye versus the um, uh, multi-imager or multi-sensor, depending upon um, who you ask. And let me just remove one more camera. Okay. So in this, uh, in this scene, we have a, a few different cameras set up. So up top, we have a multi-imager. So this is uh, three different image sensors that we have. Um, so we have uh, three different image sensors. It's all under one housing. Um, Jermaine, can you throw the spec sheet for the uh, Q3708 into chat? So Jermaine will throw that in. It's a, a, a fixed position multi-imager. So the manufacturer made this camera and they put um, not just one uh, lens and sensor and processor, but they put three of them uh, all under one hood that uh, you know point out to different uh, areas. This uses one cable drop with one IP address. Uh, depending upon how your VMS works, uh, it's very likely going to take one license, but you really need to check with your manufacturer on what um, what kind of support your VMS has for these multi-imagers. And then also what kind of licensing it might take, because uh, it could be different across different VMSs. Now, that's uh, one look that we can do to get a, a good view of our front parking lot here. And we have a, a pretty good view of, you know, 180 degree field of view on this large parking lot that we have out front. Now, if we go out back, um, I'll switch to uh, two here. And what do I need? The back door. So out back, we have a, a couple different um, looks here. We have two different um, cameras that we're using out back. And one is a uh, door station, which is kind of a panoramic fisheye. Is about a 180 degree field of view. I think it's too short of that, probably about 170 or so with um, cropping or 160, somewhere around there, the way, the way it crops and then the way it integrates with the BMS. But uh, you can see, I get a great um, situational awareness of what's going on in the back of the building. So this is, if I just want to know, hey, is a, a, you know, is a garbage man here to empty the, 
the dumpsters are their kids. Uh, there's a great hill. The kids love skateboarding and biking on it from the neighborhood. Um, are the trucks here? Uh, is somebody in the shipping container? Is there somebody trying to jimmy the slock? I, I have a basic idea of what's going on back here, uh, whatever the scenario is. And then if I want to, uh, if I want to look at different areas, um, one of the things that I can do is I can use a PTZ, which is pan, tilt, and zoom. So I can move this around, whether I do it as an operator, just dragging the camera around and looking and then uh, zooming in to see uh, what's going on and you know more fine level details. I can do that. Or we can set this to presets where those are uh, basically coordinates. So this could be preset one, and then we can set it on tour to go, you know, sit here for a dwell time of five seconds, go to preset two, um, or we can use buttons and control pads to do that, um, to move about the uh, field of view. So the, the big difference here with the PTZ is that we have that, that um, uh, kind of dynamic interface with it where we can pan, tilt, and zoom around the field of view pretty much anywhere that we want to look we can uh, move this and get a new field of view. Now with the fisheye, we can't do that. We kind of have a, a look at the field of view. And the, the big difference that we're gonna see here is optical zoom. So when we look at the PTZ using optical zoom, if I set it to zoom in on the shipping container, uh, again, this is verifocal. So I'm actually changing the focal length of the camera. So this is a this is a um, uh, this is a uh, 1080p camera, right? So two million pixels. So whether and I'll just back this out again real quick. Whether I'm zoomed all the way out or not, right now there's two million pixels in this field of view. If I zoom in, I'm changing the focal length. I'm not changing the resolution at all. So when I zoom in, oh, I think we missed it. When I zoom in, we still have 2 million pixels on the field of view. So when I look at that shipping container, we're still gonna have across the, um, across the scene, you know, we're gonna have, uh, here we go, we'll copy this. And I'll open up um, paint just so you can see. I'll just paste it in. So if we look at this here on the PTZ, right? If we uh, go across, well, I probably got to shrink it to fit it on the full, there we go. So if I look at this uh, image, right? You can see that we have about um, 1900 pixels going across the field of view, probably 1920. Um, so we have that many pixels going across. And if we go down, you know, we should have about a thousand, 1080. So we have about 2 million pixels in this field of view because I optically zoomed, right? I'm not zooming in on a specific section of pixels like digital zoom. And that's, that's one of the big differences. If I go back here and I switch to the, um, fisheye now I can't zoom in on this because it's fixed focal. Uh, and this is probably a one point something millimeter focal length camera. So if I digitally zoom in here, you can see uh, how the details uh, just aren't there uh, because I'm taking the amount of pixels that are in this field of view and I'll copy this and I'll throw this into paint. Just so we can see the difference in the amount of pixels that are there. So here we have, uh, 50, 50 pixels down and across the field of view is about 80 pixels. So obviously much lower pixel density here. You know, this is only, um, 80 by 50, right? So we have 400 pixels here with digital zoom compared to when we went to the, um, when we went to the PTZ where we still had 2 million across that, um, across that field of view of the uh, shipping container over there. So a, a huge difference in performance between 
PTZ and fixed focal length cameras, specifically fish eyes, and kind of the trade offs between the two. All right, so we've covered uh, a lot today. We covered um, uh, pixel density, we covered WDR, we covered low light, uh, form factors, onboard features of cameras. Um, and here is, here's a look at the multi-imager that I was using out front. It's a Q3708. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, fixed uh, imagers. So some, some multi-imagers you can get uh, from this manufacturer or others um, where you can reposition the multi-imager. So if you want a 360 degree field of view with four image sensors, you can do that. Some of them you can um, relocate uh, one of the image sensors downward directing. So great use case is a corner of a building. You know, you want a, a 270 degree field of view around the corner of a building, and then you want a direct downward shot. Uh, manufacturers give you that option to be able to do it. All right. If you have any questions about what we talked about today or the, the presentation or demonstrations or uh, any questions about IPVM or IPVM training in general, uh, go ahead and throw them in the chat. More than happy to um, hang out for a few minutes and uh, talk about video surveillance. And if you do, um, you know, if you're like me many times after a uh, meeting or presentation is over, uh, I'll be driving or doing something else and, and think of a, a really meaningful question that I should have asked. Uh, if that does happen to you, my email address is jscanlin at ipvm.com. Uh, whether you're an IPVM subscriber or not, uh, hit me up. Uh, more than happy to talk to you. And Jermaine just threw that in the chat. Jermaine at ipvm.com or jscanlin at ipvm.com. Uh, if anybody here is not a, an IPVM member, uh, shoot me an email. Let me know. I'll send you 30 days for free if you're interested in uh, checking out uh, IPVM. Could I speak about uh, camera bit rate settings? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Give me one moment. So one of the, one of the things that you can do, aside from you know when we when we talked about um, cameras and bit rate and transmission and storage, one of the things that I talked about was that. Um, you know, the, the, the higher the resolution, right? Four megapixel camera is going to be 4 million pixels. And a 4K camera is going to be 8 million pixels. So that's more data to send. Um, the uh, differences that can be had are on settings. You know, you can control the settings of the camera that you're using. So if we look at, um, let's bring up one of these cameras here. So you, you can change compression, you can change quality, you can enable smart codecs, you can enable, um, uh, you can change what codec you're using. Uh, there's all different ways to control this. You can change the resolution of the camera, which is um, you know just natively gonna drop the amount of data being sent because if you're sending you know, 2 million pixels as opposed to 4 million, you know, if, you're, if you have it in 1080p mode versus two megapixel, uh, maybe a, a, somebody specified all 4K cameras and you're using them indoors in small spaces and you really don't need eight megapixel to get the evidence that you need. Maybe you set it in four megapixel mode or, or something different where you'll, uh, you know, the benefit is you less bandwidth and storage. Okay, so here is a camera that we have. Um, it's in um, uh, corridor mode or hallway mode, which is a, another camera feature that's very helpful. 
So the, the reason that we want this in corridor mode or hallway mode is because uh, we don't want to cover a desk that's right here. We don't want to uh, cover a wall. Um, so for us, the most meaningful information is straight ahead, uh, the entire stairway and landing uh, above and below the stairway. So one of the things that we can do, uh, aside from look at uh, quarter remote, which was asked about in chat, was, hey, can we look at um, some of the settings for uh, bitrate? So some of the things that you can do, and I think I can throw the information up on the screen here. Awesome. So if, if you can see that uh, right now, we have a live display of information of um, uh, bit rate. So you can see it's very little, a very nominal amount of data being sent, five kilobits per second, um, maybe up to 500 kilobits per second. Uh, so you can see eight, 11, nine, five kilobits per second. Those are gonna be P frames. At some point we'll hit an I frame and that's gonna be like 500. Um, so one of the things, or 389 that time. <clears throat> so there's not a lot of information here. The, the scene is dormant. So it's going to be utilizing, um, uh, you know, sending P frames. And uh, right now we have a few things that we can change. Um, a, a seemingly benign setting, sharpness. If I crank that up, uh, maybe we get more usable details. I don't know. Maybe this, the scene is a little bit more uh, uh you know, looks a little bit better, but if we crank that up and change other settings, we may have a higher bit rate. Uh, you can see the bit rate is still pretty similar. We'll look at um, the stream here. So if we, if we look at the stream profile, one of the things that we can uh, do is determine what's the frame rate that we need. Uh, maybe somebody thinks that we need 30 frames a second. So if we send 30 frames a second, that's nearly gonna be, you know, it's not a, a exact, but it could possibly be double the amount of uh, bandwidth or bit rate that we're sending, uh, doubling the frame rate. So if we set that to a lower frame rate, we're sending less data. Uh, how many frames per second are we sending? Uh, and right now we have it set to 15, which again is based on the most common use case in video surveillance, which is 15 frames. Obviously there's uh, situations where 15 frames aren't going to get the job done, like uh, cash counting at a you know any environment, um, and then uh, cards at a casino. And in some, I don't know if anybody here works in a gaming commission or a casino environment, but your your regulators might not even allow you to have anything set to 15 frames on the casino floor. So Zipstream is set to high right now. Now it, that's the smart codec that Axis makes. Now, if I change the smart codec to off, we're gonna see a pretty drastic difference in um, the bit rate right here. So we went from like nine or 10, uh, maybe up to four or 500 uh, with a P frame. And now with the smart codec off, we have a thousand or 1100 kilobits per second. So there are uh, a tremendous you know, difference in the amount of data that we're sending um, and it, you know, there's not you know anything special about access. This is going to be true if you're using um, Hanwha or Hike Vision or Dawa or VivoTech, GeoVision, Bosch. Name name a manufacturer. They're all going to have their own um, name for their own smart codec, which is going to provide you know not the same but uh, similar results. So one of the things that you can control here is Zipstream on or off. And then if we uh, go back and look at the bit rate with uh, 1,082, um, some of the other things that, that might change at, you know, changing sharpness from all the way up to all the way down, brought it from 1,100 down to 385. Um, so optimize your settings, but also look at the effect that they have on your, um, you know, on your video surveillance storage and, and uh, network congestion. Also, the, another good time to look at these settings is when a manufacturer comes and visits you and says, hey, I have this great camera. It performs awesome. Check it out. Uh, make sure that they're really comparing apples to apples and that they don't have you know, something like you know, one of these settings jacked up and you, you don't know that that's causing bandwidth to spike to, to triple. You know, it's going from 300 to 1,200 or quadruple, really. Um, so make sure that settings are, are kind of normalized between the different cameras if, if somebody's trying to uh, sell you on something. 
Uh, it's a big part of our testing here at IPVM, normalizing settings to make sure that we are truly comparing, you know, honest, best foot forward for each manufacturer. So there is the, uh, you know, the optimization settings, which may affect it, you know, depending upon uh, what's going on in the scene. Uh, light levels are going to affect bit rate. If you have a low light environment, again, like we talked about, you're going to have a higher bit rate. Uh, Jermaine, can you can you put that into um, chat? I think we have a, a report on uh, low light versus bandwidth or bit rate, something similar to that. Uh, it's basically just a study of different cameras in full light versus low light and the, um, the difference in uh, bandwidth or bit rate utilization. So here, here's a big factor. Again, light is the kind of the nemesis for uh, good video surveillance or the lack of light or too much light. Um, so you can, you can look at this report and see that um, on average, it's 145% increase for bandwidth um, in low light environments. And some, depending upon what manufacturer you're using, see who the, the monster is here. Um, pretty close between a Vigilon and Hike Vision, one, one camera from each manufacturer, uh, 414% and 415% increase. So if you, if you estimate what your storage should be uh, or what your, your network should look like based on the bandwidth and, and how much we're going to be utilizing, um, that might all be uh, blown out the uh, door when you turn the lights off because the bandwidth is going to increase or the bit rate is going to increase 414%. So you're quadrupling the amount of, uh, you know, uh, either network or storage that you need. So those are some of the things that we can, we can look at. The, the lighting scene complexity is also going to determine uh, bandwidth. You know, if we have a dormant scene, it's going to be very low. If we have a busy scene, it's going to be much higher. Again, movement, you know, the more things that are moving in the scene, the more uh, data that needs to be transmitted. Uh, so we have, you know, the, the camera optimi optimization settings. I just showed uh, sharpness. More important to look and see what changes it makes to the quality. Uh, and then as a secondary thought, think about how it's going to affect um, your bandwidth or storage. And then for the stream settings, uh, and this is going to be true across other manufacturers, not just um, the one that we're using right now, but... Um, you can, uh, again, you can change the resolution. If you don't need that full resolution, you don't need to use it. You can step it down. You can use a different aspect ratio. Uh, aspect ratio isn't going to make as uh, meaningful as an impact as uh, resolution because it's just less data. Um, frame rate, you know, if you just by default have everything set to 30, you might want to look into setting things at 20 or 15. If there's not a, a business case, why you need to do that. You know, if there's not some, uh, uh, you know, engineered design that has told you to do that, you might want to look at lowering frame rate. Uh, you can also specify uh, one of the big things like compression. You know, if you crank compression all the way down, we were at, um, you know, medium, I think a 30 level compression here and we were at like a thousand. So if I turn compression all the way down with a smart codec off, it's up to 17,000 kilobits per second. You know, again, compared to... Um, compression uh, normalized with smart codecs on high, that went down to like nine kilobits a second. So there are some really meaningful things that you can change on your camera to uh, control this. So if we set that axis as default, and this is something that's gonna change across manufacturers everywhere. If you look at, like I said before, there's uh, compression versus quality, um, and then uh, manufacturers have all different numbers. So here we can bring uh, this one up to 100, on others, it's a scale of zero to 50, zero to 51, uh, high, low, uh, lowest, higher. Um, you know, there's descriptors rather than numerical values for this. There are um, inverse controls, you know, instead of compression, there's quality. So there's a bunch of different things that you can um, change, uh, you know, across all different manufacturers. Um, yeah, so I hope that um, answers your question. Uh, can we talk about camera bit rate and settings and optimization. All right, well, if anybody has any questions, again, don't be shy. Uh, we're absolutely happy to hear from you. 
So if you are, um, uh, again, if you're, if you're not currently uh, on IPVM, uh, go ahead and hit me up, jscanlon at ipvm.com. If you're interested in anything, we can give you 30 days for free to check it out. If you do have questions about anything we talked about today, uh, let me know. I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer them. Uh, and it looks like, um, oh, one more question. Uh, with Smart Codex, you mentioned that the device will automatically adjust to the scene. Does this mean that you would miss quality when a busy scene starts? So that that may be one of the trade-offs, uh, Miklos. Uh, one of the things that we, um, uh, I think, have slated to schedule is testing Smart Codex versus um, quality uh, versus missing anything. So uh, you're spot on in, in picking up the fact that if you're utilizing a Smart Codex, one of the things that happens is those changes happen that 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 dynamic compression the dynamic um uh, uh iframe interval those things might happen when the, the scene gets busier 